to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Listeners, welcome back to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and I'm here with Bill Schofield and with John Harrigan. Hey guys, how's it going? Hey, hey. Howdy. Well, listeners, it's great to have you again. We dropped a Q&A for you last week, but in our episode on the Tanakh last time, before that, we talked about the book of Ezekiel. And just like all the other written prophets, we saw how Ezekiel continues the theme of covenantal maintenance. And even though there's some disorganization to the book, we saw that really in so many ways, Ezekiel is projecting forward so many of the themes that are foundational to Israel's history and their story, details that are all just laid down in Deuteronomy. And we discussed how Ezekiel's prophecy uses Israel's history as a mechanism to describe Israel's future eschatological exile and redemption. And uh, we also spent some time discussing how some of the features in Ezekiel, including heavenly vision, heavenly revelation, heavenly travel, uh, how those things get linked with eschatological revelation. And again, how all of that is connected to God's covenantal promises that he really is going to bring to pass all that he said. So in today's episode, we want to start looking at the minor prophets. We want to start with Hosea and Joel and Amos. But you might be thinking, hey, wait, you discussed Ezekiel in the last episode in the prophets, in the the Nevi'im, so aren't you going to talk about Daniel now? I mean, there's so many cool passages there in Daniel. (laughs) So you might be a little bit surprised that we're not going to talk about Daniel today. Now, don't forget, we're discussing the Tanakh, specifically the prophets, the Nevi'im, and Daniel actually is not part of the Nevi'im in the Tanakh. So it's actually part of the writings, the, the Ketuvim. So we'll discuss Daniel and more in the next section of our season on the Ketuvim. So don't worry, it's coming. But guys, like we always do, let's get into a little overview of the Minor Prophets in general before we dive specifically into Hosea and Joel and Amos. Yeah, the Minor Prophets in the Tanakh are known as the Twelve, or also known as the Book of the Twelve, because they were uh, viewed as one scroll. And uh, most believe that it was originally... uh, a scroll with the first six, Hosea through Micah, and then another scroll with the second six, Nahum through Malachi. And uh, traditionally, they're viewed as kind of the first six are in the eighth century, uh, the second six are in the seventh, uh, sixth, and then Malachi in the fifth century. And so they were viewed as a canonical whole. Uh, Later in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have um, all 12 together. Uh, or evidence of that, and so it was viewed as as one book with the twelve uh, prophets together. Yeah, and and it kind of and and that fits even the larger concept of having a Bible, right? Because remember, Bible doesn't a Bible is is a word that's derived from the old Latin word that means library. And so to have them as a cohesive book or as a, as a collection of book that basically form a whole is, uh, makes sense because you're just recognizing that they're saying the same thing. They're all referencing the same general dynamics, even if they do span several centuries, like John was saying. But, uh, the, like we'll find out that w- with the minor prophets as we're jumping in today, um, like with the other prophets, the covenant dynamic is what's in view. And this is the thing that's reiterated, again, various contexts, uh, various audiences, um, but it's the, it's this covenantal dynamic or, or cycle. Sometimes we say covenantal cycle. And just to clarify, even when we say cycle, we're not usually talking about like an endless cycle that doesn't end. We're talking about the dynamic of, like we referenced back in the Deuteronomy episode, not an endless cycle, but one that has a climactic end, as as y'all know. But um, so the it's it's the it's the covenantal dynamic or cycle from Deuteronomy that is just played out throughout the prophets again, throughout the minor prophets, just like in you know Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, like we've seen already. But like um, in Amos four. You have a reference, you, you have a reference to, because Amos is generally fairly negative. We're going to get into Amos in a little bit. Amos is generally pretty negative. Uh, 
um, except for the very end, um, like literally the last couple of verses, but the rest of it's super negative. And, and when it gives kind of, cause it's more elaborate than, than, uh, like Joel, for example, but it'll give like some of the, some of the details and some of the particulars. And one of the things it highlights is, it says, I sent pestilence and blight and these things kind of like, the latter part of Deuteronomy 28, and you didn't respond. You didn't return to me. And so what's being evoked there is that the whole, the, the entire, the entire narrative that's being portrayed there is assumed to be a part of that covenantal dynamic that, that Deuteronomy brings up. So the cycle gets pushed to its ultimate end, as we've talked about over and over again, this kind of covenantal cycle that happens in Deuteronomy. And you can see it cyclically in book, books like the book of Judges, right? But, um, but then we, we, we see then how it comes to an end. In the apocalyptic literature, very specifically, it, it, essentially, uh, it essentially does that. Yeah, and that, that cycle or that dynamic is really is the driver for the whole book all 12 prophets so it's yeah. not you you can't look at each book and try to figure out what each book is saying you know it's it's the prophets are all saying the same thing but they might be highlighting particular particular realities happening historically you know like Amos is specifically in context to Jeroboam the second directly um and you, you know the later prophets are speaking in different historical contexts, but the whole book is saying the same thing about the covenant cycle, Deuteronomy 28, sins, the breaking of the covenant, the coming divine discipline, and it's getting pushed forward in time, as we'll see uh, specifically to the day of the Lord, that that cycle is climaxing in the day of the Lord, and then the restoration of Israel in Deuteronomy 30. And so, when you get to the apocalyptic literature, you have a kind of a glossing of the the book of the Twelve as one package of the prophets came and spoke against the sins of Israel. And so, it's not like they're all saying something different or saying have particular messages, is that they're all saying basically the same thing. And so, you know, like in the like in the cloud apocalypse in in Second Baruch, chapter sixty two, which is the seventh dark cloud, is just about this time of kind of the northern kingdom and Jeroboam the second and his two calves, and 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 how that was passed on. You know. Uh, to those after him, and and it just summarizes that God sent prophet after prophet to Israel to the kings to to call them to repentance. Likewise, in uh, in the animal apocalypse in First Enoch, basically it summarizes the same thing. Um, in chapter eighty nine, it says again, I saw those sheep how they went astray, going in diverse ways, and abandoning God's house. Then the Lord of the sheep called from among the sheep and sent them to the sheep. But the sheep began to slay them, and he sent many other sheep to those sheep to testify to them and lament over them. And so you get a summary of kind of this season in First and Second Kings with one king after another and Israel just continuing to go astray and, and, and violate the covenant and the prophets being sent one after another to call Israel back. And so that's how, you know, the apocalyptic literature kind of interprets the book of the 12 as as one uh, uh, saying the same thing, in in essence. So it helps as we come to uh, the minor prophets that we don't have to try to get into each book and figure out each one and figure out like some sort of secret saying like no they're all saying the same thing and it's all based around Deuteronomy it's it's fairly straightforward right yeah yeah that's great guys i think one other thing that we should keep in mind as we look at the prophets and we've been saying this all along relating this all to the covenantal dynamic but as westerners i think it can, it can really feel easier at times just to open up the prophets and find some good principles about God, about what he's like. Like, oh, look, God is strong and mighty, and he redeems his people, and he punishes evil, or he hates injustice, or he rewards the righteous, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And 
I think while those things are true, I think that if you do that first when you approach the prophets, you're going to miss the entire point of what's going on and why the prophets are saying what they're saying. And so if you find out what's going on and why the prophets are prophesying, I think what you come away with, most importantly, is God is faithful to his covenant. Yeah. And with that as the foundation, instead of just a sea of words where you can kind of fish out some good principles about God, you walk away with a very different picture that has to do with the larger story of God's dealings with Israel to fulfill his covenant with them and with Abraham to use them to be a blessing to the rest of the nations. And I think you walk away seeing the covenant as the driver of history rather than arbitrary feelings that God has at certain moments in Israel's story. Mm -hmm. And even as you mentioned, John, I think like in the cloud apocalypse and the animal apocalypse, God's highlighting the covenantal dynamic over and over and over again. And with that as the foundation, I think it makes what we're going to look at today in the minor prophets a lot easier to understand and comprehend. So with that, Guys, let's start with Hosea here. And I think just by way of introduction, we can say just a a few general things. Here's Hosea prophesied during the 8th century BC, during the reign of Josiah and Jeroboam II. And he prophesied to the northern kingdom because 35 times in Hosea, we see a reference to Ephraim, the name used to refer to the northern kingdom during the late 8th century. And there's just a whole bunch of turmoil, just a bunch of crazy stuff going on in the book. As we see from uh, 2 Kings 15 through 17, we can see they had six different kings in just 30 years. That's crazy. So some of the big themes Hosea is prophesying about, of course, um, idolatry, that's a huge one. Uh, It was just rampant during the days of those six kings. And Hosea, in that first part of Hosea, likens the idolatry of Israel to adultery and whoredom, the idea that Israel has forsaken the covenant with God, their husband, and prostituted themselves after other gods, other lovers. And this is just a huge theme that's developed in the early part of Hosea. Uh, Then we see this covenantal dynamic playing out and ultimately concluding with an eschatological hope and promise in the later part of Hosea. Yeah, I think a representative passage of Hosea is chapter 3. It's only five verses, and it comes on the heels of chapters 1 and 2, where Hosea goes and marries a, a prostitute, and she becomes unfaithful, continues unfaithfulness, and and it's, you know, chapter 2, it's God uh, representing his relationship with Israel, <clears throat> that Israel is unfaithfulness, unfaithful, like you said, Josh. And then chapter 3 comes in, and the Lord says, chapter 3, verse 1, the Lord said to me, again, go love a woman who has a lover and is an adulteress, just as the Lord loves the people of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raising cakes. And so you get the reference to uh, to idolatry. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer of barley and a measure of wine. And I said to her, you must remain as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore. You shall not have intercourse with a man, nor I with you. For the Israelites shall remain many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or teraphim afterward. The Israelites shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall come in awe to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. So you get kind of the the whole of the covenantal dynamic or cycle where Deuteronomy 28, the the breaking, the unfaithfulness to the covenant, uh, the, the distress that comes upon them, and then Deuteronomy 30, the restoration to the land. In light of the Davidic covenant, you know, that restoration, Deuteronomy 30, involves an idealized Davidic king that comes. Yeah, that's good. And, and uh, analyzing Hosea in terms of its influence later, I think um, its influence a lot rests on the on various ways that he communicates in addition so he'll bring up various themes like he'll bring up the idea of adultery as a metaphor for idolatry and that is obviously very influential later but you know we 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 can see that in Isaiah Jeremiah Ezekiel but Hosea was written before those and so those uh so Hosea in that sense, becomes influential on, on the communication style and presumably the 
the kind of the narrative of history. Yeah, and I think the prophetic act that happens in Hosea that's so pronounced, you know, that you see later yeah, uh, that good. gets rehearsed, particularly in Ezekiel, I think the prophetic act gets kind of enshrined in the prophetic tradition to used as a means of evoking uh, a response and repentance. Mm, and so, by yeah. the time you get to the New Testament and you get kind of prophetic acts or parables that are spoken as a story form of the prophetic act, the the point that everybody knows is that the, the prophetic act is not a retelling of, yeah. you know, Israel's redemptive narrative, but it's a, it's spoken in such a way to evoke repentance. And that's the point yeah. of it. Though seeing, they don't see. Though hearing, they don't hear. And so, the purpose of the parable and the prophetic act is to bring about repentance because you're dealing with a hard-hearted people and a lack of repentance. That's right. the purpose right. of it. So, I think Hosea really sets that sets that tone for the prophetic tradition of kind of a crying out, how do we get people to repent? That's good. That's a great point. And, um, you know, all of this it, for, for Hosea, that's going to be framed a lot in terms of uh, the marriage, you know, the, obviously the symbolism of the marriage, that's a big deal. Um, and then he's going to basically, when he breaks away from kind of the, the, the metaphor, he's, he's going to kind of speak in a straightforward manner about an eschatological everlasting covenant with Israel. And, and, uh, in, in Hosea two, it happens after a, because it's conclusive because it's an everlasting covenant that doesn't get dissolved or broken anymore. And so you have that after a final exile and a final, what he calls, I will allure her to the wilderness and speak comfortably to her there. And probably lies behind, at least in the back of Ezekiel's mind, when Ezekiel is talking about what we referenced last in the episode on Ezekiel a couple of weeks ago on the um, on uh, the uh, Israel being drawn eschatologically to the wilderness of the nations and the Lord entering into covenant with her there. So. In that sense, it's very influential. Um, it has some particulars in the narrative that seem to become important after after uh, Hosea. Um, so the the so the you have the exile, wilderness, everlasting covenant as a as a paradigm for both Ezekiel and and then for Jeremiah. If you read Jeremiah's context from thirty thirty one thirty two. Really, the whole framework for the new covenant or everlasting covenant that we have in Jeremiah really happens in that succession, final exile, final redemption to the land. And then that's the context where the Lord or, or a wilderness, a wilderness wandering and then a uh, then a final uh, uh, covenant, everlasting covenant that, that will kind of define things moving forward. So th those things become really influential. Um, even even later in um, even later in Qumran, there's a there's a uh, Nafshi, There's a there's a, a a psalm in in Qumran. It's it's uh, it's document four Q four thirty four. If anybody's looking it up, but it references some of the language in Hosea about about God basically making an everlasting covenant with her in faithfulness and righteousness in the, the language of Hosea 2, it references that in context to like Psalms 2, to 2 Samuel 7. And so it has this, it already has this eschatological narrative, and it actually has Hosea 2 in the very center of the eschatological narrative of the kings of the earth. And then kind of what it concludes with is Hosea 2. In this psalm, again, it's not a. All it is is a, it's an it's a it's a thanking God for for what He's going to do in redemption, and it sees Hosea too as being very influential there. So it, the 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 influence of Hosea is seen mostly in the way it kind of frames uh, 
the redemptive narrative, especially kind of the the eschatologically how things are going to go down, it becomes really influential both in the prophets and then in um, specifically we saw right here in Qumran, but really uh, other literature, other Second Temple literature is going to pick up kind of the 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 same track. And so Hosea, in in that sense, is is you know it's hard to exactly quantify Hosea's influence, but it's it's pretty significant. Yeah, that that marriage metaphor. I mean, you know, Hosea is one of the earliest, if not early, the earliest to frame the covenant with Israel as uh, as a marriage metaphor. You kind of have father son before that, uh, but as far as a marriage metaphor in Deuteronomy twenty eight through thirty being that being used, Hosea really kind of enshrines that in the prophetic tradition, yeah. and then that gets projected forward in the apocalyptic tradition. To its ultimate end, where it's going to be the marriage of God and Israel through the Messiah at the you know wedding banquet of the Messiah, and right. on the day of the Lord and and the restoration of Israel. So so the marriage metaphor becomes uh, kind of um, enshrined or 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 apocalypticized later on uh, when it's pushed to its ultimate end. But the point is not that some new revelation is happening. The point of using the metaphor is just to reinforce the the gravity, the severity of the relationship. It's deeply mm-hmm. personal to God. It's he's he's invested everything into this, you know, and yeah. and it's it's a breaking reality when 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 that relationship is violated. And so, you know, Hosea 6, chapter 6, really kind of exemplifies this feel uh, where it says in verse 4, What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud that the dew that goes away early, there, you know, it's fleeting, whatever. Therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets. I have killed them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love, not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But as Adam, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly with me. Gilead is a city of evildoers tracked with blood as robbers lie in wait for someone. So the priests are banded together. They murder on the road to Shechem. They commit a monstrous crime. In the house of Israel, I've seen a horrible thing. Ephraim's whoredom. Whoredom's just a great word. Whoredom is there. Israel is defiled. For you also, O Judah, a harvest is appointed when I would restore the fortunes of my people. And so there's this kind of the it it's a deeply personalizing of the covenant uh, with God and and what is God to do about it? He's he's all in on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, guys, let's get into Joel now. And I think the book of Joel is maybe a little bit more maybe well-known than Hosea or Amos. It's got three chapters, lots of apocalyptic imagery, lots of covenantal language. And there's an interesting link between Joel and Amos that has made scholars wonder about the dating of the book. There's this phrase in Joel chapter 3, verse 16, that's really similar to Amos chapter 1, verse 2. And it says, the Lord roars from Zion and he utters his voice from Jerusalem. So can that tell us anything about when Joel was written? Yeah, the big question concerning Joel is primarily the date. And so it's become very common to date uh, uh, Joel late as in the exile or even after post-exilic, talking back about the Babylonians. Traditionally, of course, uh, Hosea, Joel, and Amos are, are tied together. Uh, in the eighth century and saying the same thing. And, and so I would tend to, uh, kind of lean towards the, the traditional view that Joel is early. And most of the, the issue around the dating of Joel is trying to anchor Joel in some historical, because of course, Hosea and Amos have very clear historical markers, but Joel does not. There's, there's none. And, there's, uh, uh, why, why is that such there's, a... There's zero. Why is people obsessed with that? There's, right, there, there's no way. 
So, so then, you know, there's always trying to an anchoring of Joel to either the Assyrians or to the Babylonians, but Joel's talking to Jerusalem and Judea. So it's people want to kind of anchor it to the Babylonians. And, and so to me, it's a little bit like the Olivet Discourse where there's, there's no historical reference being particularly made, but there's a reading into it. So, I, you know, personally, I don't see the Olivet Discourse talking about 70 AD at all. It's just talking about the covenantal dynamic in an apocalyptic context that, you know, Deuteronomy 28 is going to come to its climax in the, in the, and the messianic woes, the eschatological distress, and then the day of the Lord comes. And so, same way with Joel, where there's, for me, there's no reason to read into Joel any, you know, historical markers. And even the ones that people that are, are emphatic about, when you read them, it's like, well, I, I, that, that doesn't seem to reference anything particular yeah. at yeah. all. So. Uh, so the point of the book of Joel is just that it falls in line with the other, you know, the kind of broader narrative of the covenantal dynamic. The other main argument is that Joel is, you know, quoting from a lot of other prophetic literature. And but if Joel is early, then other prophetic literature is kind of quoting from him right. and Joel is injecting a lot of the main themes, particularly the day of the Lord into the conversation earlier on. Um, so either way, uh, you know, I don't think it's bad to have a late date, but the longer time goes on, I, I tend to think that uh, Joel fits better uh, with within the traditional narrative being an, uh, an earlier uh, prophet. Um, and so the point falls in line with the rest of the minor prophets at the time is the covenantal cycle. What's lacking, of course, in Joel is the specific naming of the sins. And Joel just kind of jumps straight to the eschatological distress that is the result of the sins. And so you get a real focus so a lot of people will try to kind of disconnect Joel from uh, Hosea and Amos because there's that lack of kind of the emphasis on the sins themselves. But I would say Joel just has a different focus, and the focus is on the the result, the consequence, which is the eschatological distress in yeah. light of the day of the Lord. But then chapter 3, again, picks up the restoration. Yeah, that that's good. Um yeah, and the other thing with the prophets, too, is we think of them uh, early, and that's good, but at the same time, they are appearing in a historical context, and, and sometimes, like, like in the case of Joel, it's very possible that what he's saying fits into an existing conversation of what's going on, because he doesn't mince words. He doesn't talk like nobody is going to understand what he's talking about. Like, he seems to think that everybody understands what's going on. There's, like, a lot assumed in the conversation about the locust plague. Right. And there's clearly there's clearly the historical locust plague. Uh, there's sure. no way to date the yeah. locust plague in chapter one. Yeah. But he's just taking that historical event and projecting it into the future of the right. coming divine judgment and Deuteronomy 28 is going to happen for sure. Yes. A greater locust plague. Right. But that can, there's no specific thing associated. But, but you, but when you, when you come to Joel, you, you like, if you're, if you're, if you are really familiar with the Torah and you're really familiar with the covenant dynamic, then Joel doesn't come out of nowhere and saying these things. And you recognize them when he's talking you understand this is just he's just elaborating on the latter part of Deuteronomy 28 when he talks about the Lord sending enemies into your land to to conquer your crops and to and and to take your children captive and things like this this is this is all part of the covenant dynamic in Deuteronomy if you're familiar but if you're not familiar like Josh mentioned the tendency to just mine everything for biblical principles but if you're not familiar, there's a there's a real unfortunate tendency to look at Joel and to kind of mobilize it to basically as though what what the message of Joel is is random bad stuff is coming because there's never any explanation of what the sins are. 
So random bad stuff is coming. It's and and the way it gets interpreted, it's probably of no fault of yours. Just random bad stuff. But God is willing to deal with all your problems and break in if you'll fast and pray. And that's just not what Joel is about. Joel is definitely about an overt covenant dynamic going on. And it's just kind of like Hosea uses the analogy of marriage. He's using this as an analogy to demonstrate the, basically the dynamic talked about in, uh, that's, that's just a little more straightforward and dry in Deuteronomy 28. Where God, if you still don't repent, then God will give you over to your enemies and they'll come into your land and they'll take your children captive and they'll, then you'll no longer, you know, reap from your own crops that I gave you and they will reap all your crops. And so this is just, this is just kind of what Hosea does to the marriage or to, uh, to covenant faithfulness. He's kind of doing the same thing in terms of the uh, latter part of Deuteronomy 28 with all the, with all the locust talk. And I think I think this is picked up at the end of Joel two, going into Joel three, and so just suspend kind of the associations with the end of Joel two, and hear it as kind of Deuteronomy twenty eight playing out, and so right. verse thirty, I will show signs in the heavens and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Of course, so you get that, you know, in Isaiah uh, 13. And the association is kind of the climax of the eschatological distress for the violation of the covenant. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. So, you know, that's what doesn't get quoted like in Acts 2 later on, and what is presumably assumed in Acts 2, that they viewed themselves as in the at the end of the age and the eschatological distress right. is about to happen and Jesus exactly. is about to uh, about to return so but right. Joel 2 is just part of the the kind of covenantal narrative that's presumed and then it goes on in chapter 3 for then in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people and my heritage Israel because they've scattered them among the nations they've divided the land so what God prophesied Deuteronomy 28, the distress, the scattering among the nations, and then the regathering and the restoration in chapter 30 is is kind of played out. And that I that Joel 2 is just saying, I'm going to pour out my spirit on the remnant at that time at the end of the age to sustain them through the eschatological distress. So it fits within the covenantal cycle, you know, in a reasonable way. Yeah, and this is basically what we discussed in a previous episode in season one. It was actually episode nine when we talked about Joel 2 and Acts 2 and Peter's quote of Joel 2 in Acts 2. Again, you get the apostles who understand the Tanakh and the covenantal dynamic, and they're viewing themselves within this covenantal cycle. And they're saying, oh, the eschatological tribulations at hand, this is why God's pouring out his spirit. The day of the Lord is coming, and he's calling us to our covenantal calling, uh, our our covenantal role to be his witnesses, just as Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, right? So seeing all of this within the covenantal framework, I think is just so, so key. And this is why the quote of Joel 2 in Acts 2 is just so, so significant. Yeah, that's good. And I've, I've always wondered, too, there's an interesting dynamic at the end of that passage that uh, right in the middle, I guess, the passage uh, that John read where it says in the Hebrew text, it says um, in Mount Zion in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Um, for some reason, and I, I, I don't exactly know why, but for some reason, it's one of the three references to the word translated in the New Testament as gospel. 
is actually inserted there. Instead of survivors, it's actually among those who, those who heard the gospel whom the Lord calls. And so presumably, if you read, if you read above that, Presumably what he's saying is that that which was announced just before that was the gospel, and those that heard it are and responded right are the ones who got saved. So I, I always wondered how much influence that particular one had, because it's very similar to Isaiah. It's very right. similar that it's announcing eschatological deliverance to, to Israel in, in hopes of eliciting a response. But um, So in the Septuagint, if you go to... Joel 2, verse 32. Actually, depending on the version, sometimes it's uh, in the Septuagint. Yeah, sometimes in, the, in the Septuagint, in the Septuagint, it's it's three five. Yeah, it's three five. Well, it depends on whose version. There's another version of Septuagint that does it according to the Hebrew text. Well, that's so true. No, you're right. It's confusing, but so, but that's what I was going to say. So, depending on where you look it up, it's either it's either it's either same one two thirty two or it's three five. But it says they that have the, the gospel preached to them. So presumably, it, uh, it actually, instead of survivors, it's, it's inserting the word, those who've had the gospel preached to them that the Lord called. Those, those are the ones that the Lord saves in the eschatological deliverance. So that's a really interesting. That, that's always caught my attention about that, uh, the end of that passage in Joel as well. Yeah, and so different, you know, English translations of the Septuagint, like the Lexham, you know, Rick Branham, uh, his he translates it as an active. So he translates it, um, and it will be that everyone who invokes the name of the Lord will be saved, because in on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, those will be rescued. The Lord said, and those proclaiming the good news whom the Lord has summoned, and so you know, in Acts two, if that's how they're hearing it. They would, since they're reading, of course, the Septuagint, that's going to be even more that in light of the imminent eschatological distress and then the tongues of fire to confirm the death of the Messiah and that he's returning soon, you know, that they are called to be witnesses and proclaim boldly. So, Joel 2 would have played heavily, but within that presumed apocalyptic context and the covenantal cycle. Yeah. That's good stuff. Yeah, guys. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's move on to Amos now. I think what we know about Amos is that he was a reluctant shepherd from southern Israel, a city called Tekoa, and he was sent to northern Israel during Uzziah and Jeroboam II again. And so so this is 8th century BC again. And I think a good, maybe a representative passage from the book might be Amos chapter 7, verses 10 through 17. Let me just read it real quick here. It says, Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, Go, flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it's the king's sanctuary, and it's the temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall be a prostitute in the city and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword and your land shall be divided up with a measuring line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land and Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. So again, we see the covenantal dynamic playing out in Amos, right? The scattering away from the land. And Mm -hmm. Amos is prophesying all the same stuff. Return to the covenant, be faithful to the God of Israel, stop worshiping idols, stop walking hypocritically, stop behaving unjustly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and Amos uh, introduces with the exact same words out of the end of Joel, where you have the phrase, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. And so you kind of have the the same 
uh, phraseology of the proclamation of, of the word from Zion and Jerusalem as kind of the epicenter of the prophetic voice. Uh, mm-hmm. what, what's interesting about Amos is that you get this reference in chapter 5 to the day of the Lord uh, as kind of common knowledge that, that the sins of Jeroboam are leading to this, uh, and and the idolatry associated with it is leading to divine judgment. And in chapter 5, Amos says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. It is not the day of the Lord darkness, and not light and gloom with no brightness in it. I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, etc., etc. So, there's kind of this assumption that people are talking about the day of the Lord uh, in context to the feasts and the, the, the assemblies. There's not really a lot of commentaries will kind of scratch their head on this because it's like, uh, there's not, discussion before this, unless, of course, Joel is uh, contemporaneous and it's like a kind of a a common, you know, a cultural reality going on in which the day of the Lord is being viewed as kind of a positive thing. And Amos is coming in saying, no, the day of the Lord is uh, a, a negative thing being associated with divine judgment because you've rejected his ways and violated the covenant and idolatry is happening. Yeah. So, how they would get a positive sense from Joel's Day of the Lord references, I do not know. <laughs> but Right, right. That's, but that's not Apparently, positive. it did have some sort of, there was some sort of framework for, and what, it, what it seems to be is it was a, it was basically like a, just a self-indication that they assumed that whatever the Day of the Lord was, that it was a day that was going to be great for them. Which, and that's kind of, that's, that seems to be probably why the tone of Amos is so intense. That is, until literally like, like the last couple verses of Amos. Yeah, and I think that's why you have so much emphasis in Amos on the fruit of injustices. And Amos kind of listing the sins yeah. off and the injustices of of the, the priests and the kings and, and the people. Amos saying... Everything's not right. Uh, everything's not good. Uh, the, the the these things are fruits of the violation of the covenant that's going to result in divine judgment. Yeah, and that and that and that is one thing that you get in the prophets that is actually really helpful because um, I think it's a great supplemental reading of the Torah because of the fact if if you read because. We're so disconnected from the Torah. We read the Torah as like a theological treatise, right? And it, it's all theology and it never breaks down or we don't ever see it breaking down. And the prophets really emphasize how it breaks down, right? It, it, it does break down into this fruit of like rampant injustice and oppression of the poor every time, every single time. The poor are marginalized. And, 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 and the issue with wickedness being exalted and, and injustice, even immorality, ultimately is that it breaks down into injustice like this. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes when reading the prophets, I actually think about the, the, the issues like plenty of secular um, commentators on, on where the U.S. is at right now have noted, well, the, the issue in America is irreversible. Like, you can't reverse it when you have latest stats are it's 60, only 60 percent, meaning 40 percent of the homes across the country, all segments of society are, are, are in broken homes. Forty percent. Which is and it's like you can't reverse it. And it's like it's like there's there are real consequences to breaking off the the fetters from from Psalms 2 and those play out a ton in in books like Amos where injustice is so central and injustice really becomes like 
he can just speak directly to the injustice and all the and, and then occasionally reference the things implied that led to the injustice, idolatry and and immorality and these things. But injustice is what kind of takes the conversation here. Yeah, because the the injustice is tied to idolatry directly because the gods aren't like yeah. the God of Israel. The the gods of the nations aren't holy and don't call their people to be holy. They are gods. Right. They they they're warlike, they're overly sexual, they're uh you know, prosperity oriented. There's no morality kind of uh, uh hemming them in. Exactly and so there's right. no direct application to discipleship of I the Lord am holy, therefore be holy like me. And so the, right. the push on injustice is, well, you're being like the gods that you're serving, but the real problem is the violation of the covenant around the relationship and idolatry. So, even when there's a push on injustice, the push drives back to the idolatry that's at the core of it. You're being like the peoples yeah. around you because you're serving the gods around you. Right. And I that's remember good. just reading uh, uh, an article on that kind of tied evolution to the widening gap in in the West economically because there's no – the same thing, evolution. Like, you have a, a culture now that's serving this evolutionary worldview, and if you want to, you know, put religious terms on it, the, the God is Mother Nature, and that's the one that's kind of – but the whole <laughs> – the morality of that thing does not restrain people to be self-denying, to – be merciful to, you know, be altruistic in any way. You have people like Dawkins arguing for it, but it's not the reality of it. It's survival of the fittest. It's no. survival of the smartest. It's survival of of those that reproduce. It's wh- whatever. And so you have the same di- – it's obviously a completely different context, but same dynamic happening in the prophets. Same, same thing. Yeah, it is the same thing. That's good. <clears throat> now, when Amos, I, I can't talk about Amos without talking about the conclusion. Um, and the conclusion is rather radical. Of course, we talked about the conclusion back in uh, season one. It was episode 16. We talked about Acts 15. And <clears throat> we talked about the reference there. I think we had a few on Acts 15 in the Jerusalem Council. I think it was the, it might have been the last one. Um, but we talked about the reference to Amos 9. And I, so reading, reading, uh, reading a little bit just prior to that reference in Amos 9, 11, you get, you get the starting in verse eight, you actually get kind of like a, a kind of a broader theme of an eschatological, uh, what do you call it? We'll, we'll call it a, a dynamic that's going to go on, that he's predicting, and that's going to climax in the rebuilding of the fallen booth of David. But he says, starting in verse 8, the eyes of the Lord are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth, except that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. For lo, I will command and shake the house of Israel among the nations as one shakes with a sieve, but no pebble will fall to the ground, meaning because it was a method of kind of getting the chaff out with like a sheet. <clears throat> and all the sinners of my people will die by the sword who say evil will not overtake or meet us. And then on that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins, rebuild it as in the days of old. Then it goes on like in Acts 15. But the point is, is he sees like this, um, this eschatological event happening where there's this conclusive dynamic where the Lord sifts the whole house of Israel among the nations, and it basically causes the chaff, and you know the chaff to die, in the in when you remove the the uh, metaphor. And those who are not, not a pebble will fall to the ground. And so um, you, have, you have the same dynamic, you have the same conversation in, in Joel, I think in chapter 3, and in other passages where it talks about a, 
a sifting floor where the Lord makes a distinction eschatologically between uh, between the Israelites that will that will turn and those that won't turn to Him because their hearts are hardened. And so then you have, and then on that day I will raise up the fallen booth of David, and I'll repair its breaches and raise up its ruins, rebuild it as in the days of old, and the and the kingdom of God is established, and then you have the, the glory to come after that. So that that's always comes to mind with Amos. It's a great little picture to keep in mind, kind of the scenario. With with everything that Amos is saying, it's the scenario that Amos sees playing out in the future. Yeah, and I think, you know, reading Amos 9, you should read it like Hosea 3, that it's not like a particular, you know, unique revelation. It's just kind of a presumed narrative that God made a covenant with David, and it's within the broader cycle right, of right. the Deut- Deuteronomy covenant with the people as a whole. And that this thing's going to play out to an eschatological distress and then a restoration out of Deuteronomy 30 that's going to involve a Davidic king. And so it's not like a, it's not like a, there might be a particular revelation within that broad pattern, but it's still the same pattern uh, that is then kind of carried over uh, apocalyptically. Yeah. Well, And as we wrap up today, guys, I think what you said there, John, is so important to remember that this is the way that the New Testament authors were understanding and reading the Tanakh. In their epistles, in the Gospels, it's this covenantal dynamic that's driving history forward. And this is what's on their mind when they quote the prophets or allude to the prophets, especially in the three that we looked at today. This is the the game that's being played. And it's not a new game. It's not a spiritually redefined or reimagined one that's playing out surprisingly and unexpectedly in a new way. It's the same covenantal cycle, the same dynamic playing out. And as we saw through apocalyptic literature, this dynamic is projected forward to its ultimate end in a climactic, cataclysmic day where the Messiah is going to descend with fire and angels to regather and restore the nation of Israel, and then the nations will flow up to Zion to receive instruction. Well, with that said, guys, I think this has been a great introduction to the Minor Prophets. And so, listeners, in our episode next time, we want to develop the middle six of the Book of the Twelve, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. These are our relatively short books, but the message is consistent, and so we're going to look at them through the same covenantal dynamic that we've seen outlined in Deuteronomy. So, until next time, listeners, thanks for listening. God bless, and Maranatha. 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 Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel.